asked sufficiently um, high. And uh, that was like one of the many things in the Abin Marsden paper from the 70s. And uh, in the particular case, when n equals two, it's also well known to be um, globally well posed. And this goes back to uh, the work of Ginter, Lichtenstein in the 20s, and also uh, Volibner in the, back in 33. Um, but I want to do geometry, and so um, I'd like to switch. So instead of thinking of velocities, um, I want to think also of um, particle trajectories. So I'm going to switch to this sort of Lagrangian form formalism and kind of quickly remind you how that goes. So um, we define this new variable, eta of t and x, which you can think of as the position at time t of the fluid particle that at the initial time zero was at x. So if you think of like m as like a fluid vessel where the fluid is flowing, um, someone comes in at time zero and just labels all the particles by some x. Um, and then eta of t, t and x describes where that particle would label x ended up at time t, right? Um, so in particular, if you plug in t equals zero, you just get x itself because no, no one has had any time to move yet. And that's why we, we keep saying that these curves like start at the identity, right? So that's what it means. Um, and of course, these two descriptions, the Eulerian thinking of velocity fields and the Lagrangian thinking of particle trajectories are related by this equation. So um, it is just the flow of you in other words, right? Um, okay. So if you now fix a t, a particular time, and you look at the map x into a dot tx, then this is a volume preserving um, diffeomorphism of m. And so I'd like to look at the set of all of those, right? So that's this object uh, ds mu of m. So this is just a collection of all volume preserving diffeomorphisms of m. So you can think things like rotations, but more generally, um, yeah, any, any sort of deformation of your fluid domain that preserves volume. And um, well, this object carries a natural right invariant um, L2 Riemannian metric. So what does that mean? Um, if you give me two vector fields on M and M is a Riemannian manifold, I can multiply them and integrate over the whole space. This is sort of natural thing to do. Um, the formula that I have here in terms of like um, the language of Lie groups is really a metric at the tangent space of the identity of this object. So it's like a one tangent space, but then you can extend it by um, right translations and you get a metric sort of on the whole thing. Right translation here just means like if I, if I give you a volume preserving the Fermorsen eta, you plug it into X. So you replace X by eta of X everywhere. And that would be like translating this thing to another diffeomorphism eta. But then um, you can do change of variables, right? And you pick up a Jacobian of eta, but then because it's volume preserving, that's one. And so, so that's why this is um, right invariant. And of course, we're interested in this stuff because in 1966, Arnold observed that um, a curve in this um, group of volume preserving diffeomorphisms is a geodesic of this metric, if and only if the corresponding vector field solves the Euler equations that I had on the previous slide, right? So that was. Uh, the observation that kind of started this whole thing. But then um, Eben and Marsden, so in 1970, um, put this on a kind of firm um, analytic uh, background and proved that this is actually, among the many things in that paper, proved that this is actually a weak Riemannian manifold, which admits a smooth geodesic spray. So um, that was one of the things that uh, Steve was talking about on Tuesday in the, in the sort of discussion session. Um, what that really means is you, you, you have smooth uh, geodesics, at least uh, for, for short time. And so as a consequence of that, uh, we have what we call an L2 exponential map, okay? <laughs> the rest of my talk and everything I'm gonna talk about today is essentially based on this. So I wanna really make sure that, that it's clear what I mean by this map. Um, so here's how it works, right? You, you give me an initial condition U0, so that's just like some vector field uh, that will kick off the motion of the flow on the domain M. And then I take that U0 as my input. I let the flow, uh, let the fluid evolve according to the other equations. It does its thing. Uh, but then at time one, I stop the fluid and I ask each particle, where did you end up after time one? 
And this question, where did you end up, gives me a map, and that's the time one flow of u. So that's my eta of one, right? So I take some initial condition, let it run for time one, stop, and I get a map. So this is sort of like a data to solution map, but it's, uh, it's a little different because it goes from kind of the, the Eulerian perspective into the Lagrangian in some sense, right? And it's at some fixed time t, uh, fixed time one, sorry. The one is not important. If you wrote this for time two, uh, that's just like a rescaling of the initial condition. Um, but that's what the map is. And also, um, it's important to always write that u sub, uh, you know, the, the domain that I have there, u, right? Because in 2D, I could say, yeah, this map is defined on the whole tangent space. You can give me any initial condition and I can run this for time one. But as we know in 3D, uh, that's not known. So in 3D, all you know is that this map is defined for u sufficiently small. So there's at least like some open ball around the zero vector field where I can run everybody for time one, right? Um, okay, so, so that's the map that, that I'm interested in. Um, what are some basic properties, right? So we know that this map is smooth wherever it's defined in some open set, and it's a local diffeomorphism near zero. Now, when I was sort of starting into this business, uh, you know, the word smooth was a little confusing. So um, to be clear, the objects that you're dealing with, like the U0 and the U and so on, they're just HS. They have some finite regularity, right? But if you think of this as a function of u0, where like u0 is now your variable, right? Then it's actually C infinity in that sense, right? That dependence is, is smooth. Um, but then if you move sufficiently far away from zero, this map can develop uh, singularity. So there are initial configurations, u0, so that when you look at the derivative of this map, it fails to be invertible. And uh, we all know from calculus that something has to be happening there, right? There's some sort of uh, failure of something. Um, and so, so that's interesting. And uh, I will call those configurations U0 conjugate vectors. So in classical Riemannian geometry, everybody talks about conjugate points, but um, in some ways it's nicer to think of these things living in the tangent space, as opposed to um, the image of these um, configurations which I call conjugate points. So most of the time, um, I'll try to you know, be consistent with the terminology. I'll be talking about conjugate vectors. So those are these initial configurations that for some reason, the X fails to be invertible, okay? Okay, and so a basic question is, what are some examples of this, right? How do, how do we produce examples? Um, and then once you find some examples, you might ask, well, what is the structure of these singularities? And uh, what do they mean for fluid flows, right? How do you reconnect back with the story of uh, fluids? Um, and I hope to you know, address a little bit. There, there's a lot to say about this, right? So the big topic, uh, I'm certainly not gonna say uh, everything. I, mean, I don't know a lot of things about it, but um, I'll, I'll try to sort of say you know, a little bit about both questions. So question number one was actually um, a problem posed by Arnold all the way back in 66. Um, and so I'll start with that and uh, go, go back to two later. And the first, the very first examples uh, were constructed by Michelek in 93. Um, these are related to, they're basically rotations on spheres. So, uh, you know, you have conjugate points in finite dimensions and you kind of take flows that uh, kind of imitate that in the diffeomorphism group and you get some conjugate points that way. Um, and then Schneerman in 94 also produced some examples on 3D uh, cubes. Then Michelek in 96 showed that the flat two-dimensional torus um, also has uh, those special configurations that produce conjugate points. And then uh, much later in 2006, Eben, Michelek, and Preston constructed examples on a 3D cylinder. Um, there's a lot of other or at least several other examples that I'm not mentioning here. These are sort of like the very earliest. Um, and I'll also mention, I'll mention more as I go along. But um, I wanted to point out that in this list, if you look at, so aside from the 93 example, um, all the other ones, they are on flat manifolds, right? Like the fluid vessel is flat. 
And if you take a flat manifold and you look at its diffeomorphism group, like full diffeomorphism group with the L2 metric, that will also be flat. It just like inherits the geometry directly from the finite dimensional thing. And so you might ask, well, how do you get conjugate points? Because that typically requires curvature, um, right? And so what's driving, uh, really producing the curvature here is um, the submanifold condition because these are divergence free um, um, vector fields, or if you want to, Think in Lagrangian terms, they're volume preserving diffeomorphisms, and that's a submanifold of the full diffeomorphism group. And as we know, submanifolds can, can do strange things. They can curve in all sorts of ways. In fact, uh, back in 66, Arnold had, in anticipating some of this, had already computed curvatures and found that, yeah, curvatures are positive and negative, sort of, yeah, it's a mix of everything. So it's very complicated um, geometry. And okay. So uh, the next thing is, uh, was realized um, sort of more recently that there's actually a, a, a criterion, a criterion can be extracted from this 1996 uh, paper of Michiolik, right? And that's the M criterion that's in the title of my talk. Um, so how does that work? Okay, so the, the criterion that, that you can extract from that paper says that if you take U0 steady solution of the other equations, and if you can find some divergence-free vector field V that when you pair it with U0 and plug it into this formula, um, if the number that comes out is positive, then conjugate points will eventually develop along the flow of U0, right? Um, notice that this formula, the, the norm and the dot product that, that, that appear there, those are L2. So there's some, you're really integrating something over the whole manifold. Um, and it's like a curvature-like object, and, and, and it's like, you kind of understand what it's doing in the formulas, but um, at least for me, I find it hard to kind of get a feel for really what's happening, right? Um, you just like do some computations and, and um, you know, and, and if you can show the conjugate points appear by looking at index form calculation, but but it's hard to sort of understand really what's going on, um, maybe from a geometric perspective. Okay. Um, that's one of uh, the kind of puzzling things about this. And the other is that this is only a sufficient condition. So we know examples, for example, those, those from 1993 uh, that have to do with rotations on the sphere that um, where we know all the conjugate points, but they are not picked up by this criterion. And so there's something going on and some efforts recently to sort of understand uh, when exactly does this give conjugate points and why, why does it fail in sort of other situations, right? Okay, so then uh, very recently, uh, Tauchi and Tsuyoshi, um, I think the paper first appeared 2019, um, did some calculations on the two sphere for zonal flows. So I'll say a little bit more about what those are in a moment, but they show that if you take just the two sphere, the round two sphere, and uh, look at your initial condition being a zonal flow, then you can show that this criterion will not tell you anything about conjugate points. It's always um, non-positive, right? On the other hand, they show that, and, and now ellipsoids come back into the picture, um, they show that if you, U0 is a zonal flow on an ellipsoid, and here I have A uh, strictly greater than one, and furthermore supported away from the poles, um, then for those initial conditions, you actually do find conjugate points that are picked up by the M criteria. Um, okay, so first something about like, what are, what are these uh, zonal flows, right? So I, I have here just a picture. Um, so the lines you're looking at, think of them as like you're on the two sphere and you're slicing it by Z equals constant, right? And then you can imagine a flow that just like, rotates um, around these lines. But you have a little bit more of freedom, so it's not just a rotation, because you, you can go to these lines and now you can say like, um, let's say the equator is gonna run around with speed uh, 17 or something. Um, and maybe as you go up, you slow down the flow and maybe like it doesn't flow at all near the North Pole. So you can go to each one of these lines and kind of choose your speed of rotation, varying smoothly with Z or something like that. And, um, and those are the zonal flows, right? That they, that they look at in, uh, in their paper, both for the sphere and, and, and for the ellipsoid. Um, now, 
I was interested on um, kind of a special class of these flows for a completely different reason. So I was working on a different problem. Um, I wanted to prove that the group of volume preserving diffeomorphisms of the sphere is actually the base of a sort of infinite dimensional vibration where um, it, it projects down that the, the total space is uh, the group of quantomorphisms, right? So these are, these are diffeomorphisms of the three sphere that preserve uh, contact form exactly. And then, so my idea was, well, I look at some of these, like some specific zonal flows that have like um, a, a nice formula and then see if I can sort of lift those. And then I had an argument that uh, there's a paper of Lukatsky from a long time ago that says you can generate as a topological group all volume preserving diffeomorphisms of the sphere by using just four of these zonal flows, right? So I don't mean that any volume preserving is a composition of the four, but like if you keep taking compositions of four zonal flows, four specific ones, you can get as close as you want to any volume preserving diffeomorphism. And so if I could lift those four, then I could run some limiting argument and lift all of them. And, uh, and I worked some formulas for this. And then I was happy uh, that, that I was able to do it. And then I found out that actually Tudor Ratu and uh, later I think also Cornelia Wisman had already done this and, and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and um, yeah, but, but anyway, but I, I was still able to sort of use those computations to do something else. And that's sort of uh, what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, okay. Um, so we wanted to sort of generalize this to other examples such as the three spheres. So move up to three dimensions. Um, and uh, we came up with this idea of uh, sort of looking at generalized zonal flows. And by that, I mean um, in this talk that you can take any S1 killing vector field. So there's just some vector field that generates symmetries on your manifold. And uh, for technical reasons, uh, I'm gonna restrict the case where they're induced by an action of the circle, okay? And then you take any function um, and you multiply the two and that's what we call a zonal flow. So it's just some function times um, a killing field, provided that it defines a steady solution of incompressible Euler, because that's, that's the case we're interested in. And so if you impose those conditions, um, it's not hard to work out what does that say about F and X, what do they have to satisfy? And the divergence-free condition is just equivalent to X, F being zero, vanishing identically. And you get this um, condition on also the gradient of F squared, and the gradient of the norm squared of X. So the condition is like, this, this is some sort of alignment condition, right? It's a geometric condition that says that these two gradients have to be in the same direction. Um, not like a constant multiple of each other, but at least like a functional multiple. And this lambda can take any sign. Okay, and then I'm gonna say that, um, one of these zonal flows is positive if the set where lambda is positive is at least non-empty. So lambda doesn't have to be always positive, but at least like positive somewhere. Um, typically it can have both signs. And I'm gonna say that Z is geodesic if uh, nabla Z is just zero, right? Okay, so we did some computations with this. Uh, which I'm not going to bother, you know, going through them. But the bottom line is you can show that for this class of vector fields, the MC criterion kind of unexpectedly simplifies a lot. Yeah. Uh, on the previous slide, are you yeah. assuming that uh, the length of X is not constant? Um, I guess if it is constant, you get this. Yeah, you get this geodesic thing if it is constant. The ones I'm interested in won't be constant. I think the constant one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, indu it's induced by an S1 action, right? Sure, sure. No, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have, you have to have some symmetry, right? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so, so for this class of uh, zonal flows, um, we show that the, the M criterion simplifies um, a lot and and you know you, if you can find if you can find a divergence vector field that commutes with x um, you, you get you get like some simple formula right so if you look at this integral and you're trying to make this positive then 
Well, you just got to make sure that that term squared is not zero, right? And, um, and you want lambda to be positive enough that it kind of overcomes uh, its negative part, but actually, mm, so, so, okay, so as a corollary, right, on, on a 3D manifold, you can actually localize this computation. So you, it's possible to choose, um, it's always possible to choose vector fields Y that have the property that they commute with X and uh, they kind of only see the positive part of lambda actually, and, and they sort of vanish elsewhere, right? And so this gives a, as a corollary that any positive non-geodesic zonal flow on a 3D manifold um, develops conjugate points. And I guess I should also say, anytime we're talking about 3D flows, you always have this, you have to add this annoying kind of addendum that like, well, if they exist long enough, of course, right? Okay, so, um, but this is just some generality and, and we wanted a, a concrete example. And, and this is where the, the three sphere comes in, right? So because it'll be important uh, sort of to, to explain what the vector fields look like, uh, I want to say a few words about the hop vibration. Um, so one way to think of the three sphere um, is by, well, it's sort of foliated by these tori, right? So the picture you're looking at here is what would happen if you um, projected this, this sort of structure into R3. Um, but when you do that, you kind of have to like twist some things. There's a conformal factor. And so they, they certainly don't look flat, but, but on the original three sphere in R4, um, it's kind of foliated by these flat tori and has this very nice uh, structure. And, um, and it's also where like this hop vibration lives, which is like, it was like the first non-trivial map in homotopy uh, that was found between spheres of different dimensions and kind of kicked off all this, all this work on like homotopy theory. Uh, this is a picture that one of my co-authors uh, really likes. Um, he's written to this guy, Lung Yi Tsai, and uh, we've gotten permission to, to reproduce it here. Um, but anyway, so, so, so the types of flows that I'm, that, that I'm going to show you, uh, they, they kind of live on these tori, right? They, they flow along tori, but, but they, they can sort of vary between, uh, as you move from one torus to another, they, they sort of change in magnitude in some sense. Um, so let me write some, some formulas for that, okay? Um, so here's one, one possible way of uh, sort of parametrizing the sphere. You can consider, first you go to each torus and just parametrize each torus with periodic coordinates C and mu. And then I let chi be a kind of indexing parameter that tells you on which of the tori you are. And we also wanted to consider um, ellipsoids, a kind of more general uh, class of, um, of manifolds. So we, we have the stretching factor and you can write down formulas for this. This, this is what the parametrization looks like. Um, so it has this constant A, which is just um, a kind of bulge around the equator, but, but in R4, right? Um, so on each torus, you can construct this vector field, which, which is an S1 killing vector field, um, just by taking, uh, this is kind of like what you do if you have just a two torus, um, look at some rational slope, right? P over Q, and you get like periodic orbits. And so this is an example of an S1 killing field for any P and Q. Um, and then you pick a function f that depends on chi. So it'll be constant on each torus, um, but will vary sort of from one torus to the next. And for technical reasons, you pick it supported away from the poles and you also want it to be non-constant. And then you can show by you know, a bunch of computations, uh, lots of sines and cosines that um, this vector field or, or any of these vector fields z is actually like it gives an example of these non-geodesic positive zonal flows, provided you satisfy some condition that involves the, the P and the Q and also this, this A factor, right, from the, from the ellipsoid. Um, so unlike the 2D, this can work on, even on the, the sphere, the round three sphere, provided you choose P and Q sort of accordingly, right? Um, and so, so that's like one example that, um, goes with uh, with the theorem. Um, yeah, and so this is just saying the same thing. Um, there's been other examples using um, the M criterion that I also want to mention. So uh, Drivas, Michel, Xi, and Yoneda back in 21 um, 
prove that on a flat torus that so they, they they take a torus that has like one scaling factor alpha as well um, each of the Komogorov flows defined by these uh, stream functions that depend on two parameters m and n um, they have conjugate points provided um, you satisfy some inequality that has to do with m and n um, so the thing is this doesn't cover all the range of m's and n's and I think there's still a few cases uh, that haven't been worked out, but um, that's also using that M criterion. So there's some long computation and some, some big formula involving M and N comes out of that um, M, M functional. Um, further developments, uh, ben, uh, James Ben also 2021 used um, the M criterion or some adapted version of that for non-stationary flows actually on S2. Um, the only example that I'm aware of of non-stationary flows, conjugate points on non-stationary flows, um, where he also gives a physical interpretation for those in the same paper. And uh, Steve Preston more recently um, published a sort of improved version of the M criterion for 2D flows. And I think sort of in a, by a separate computation extends the, the, the MN range that was found by uh, Drivas, Misholik, Shi, and Yuneda. Um, but I think it's still, there's still some exceptional cases that are open. Um, okay, and I think these are sort of in the realm of examples and kind of how to produce them, all I wanted to say. And so let me try and say a few words about um, the next question, which was, you know, what do the, these things look like? And sort of what can you say about fluid flows um, using them? So I'll start with sort of the structure um, in this paper uh, of Eben Misholik and Preston in 2006, they show that the L2 exponential map is not just some smooth map between infinite dimensional things, it's actually a nonlinear Fred Hall map of index zero. And this means that um, both the kernel and co-kernel of its derivative are actually finite dimensional for every U zero, right? Um, so, that tells you that it, this thing is sort of kind of trying to behave as if it were a uh, finite dimensional thing, although uh, not quite. But uh, by Sard's Mayo, you can also then show, among the many things you can do with this, that conjugate points have to be isolated along finite geodesic segments. Um, so this, this is all for when M is 2D. Um, and then in 2018, I, I showed that actually the, the set of the so-called regular conjugate vectors turns out to have more regularity than maybe you would expect. Um, it, it, it's actually a smooth manifold of codimension one in the tangent space, right? So if you take just like any random function and you ask uh, what's the locus of the, the, the points where um, the derivative vanishes, right? Um, I think as a result of Whitney that that can be pretty much any closed set you want. So it can be like a Cantor set, um, some, something complicated, but uh, for fluids, it's actually much nicer than that. Um, the caveat here is that that's not necessarily all conjugate points, just uh, or, or all conjugate vectors, just the regular ones, right? Um, but regular conjugate vectors are generic, so they form an open and dense subset among kind of all conjugate vectors. Uh, so it's like almost all of them, um, and there's some places where uh, they might kind of split. So you might have like uh, kind of two sheets um, of, of conjugate points that could like potentially merge together or uh, maybe cross each other or something like that and, and produce like self-intersections type of things. Yeah. Tangent space sub of topology, yeah. For both L2 metric, yeah. yeah. It's a sub of topology L2 metric. I mean, L2 exponential map. No, no, okay, but who's performing the space? HS, HS, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, and the other thing you can do with Fred Holmness is you can actually get a local description of the exponential map near these singularities, right? So what do I mean by that? I mean, you can actually choose coordinates. Uh, I'm going to denote them by X and uh, there's a bold face H where X is some finite dimensional piece of it that lives in RK and H is, just lives in some Hilbert space 
where near a singularity, you can actually, you know, in these special coordinates, you can write it as, you can write the exponential map as like just f of x comma h. So it, it tells you that there's like some finite dimensional piece of it that is doing something interesting. And most of it is the identity. Um, it's just sort of mapping h to itself. Um, so one thing to note here is that Fred Homeness alone um, only gives you that uh, you could put it in that form, but f could potentially still depend on sort of the infinite dimensional chunk. Um, and it turns out that, that it doesn't. Um, and you can, in some cases, you can get a formula, like an explicit formula for f. Um, so here are some examples. Um, if you have a regular conjugate vector of multiplicity two or higher, it turns out that f is always this f, right? So it looks like you take some like coordinates x1 through xk plus one, and then you just take x1 and kind of multiply through all the other ones. So it looks like very like polynomial-ish, right? Um, and for multiplicity one, the interesting thing is that there are several possibilities for what that f could be. They depend on kind of the order of contact uh, between two things. One is the kernel of the derivative of the exponential map, which is always tangent to like spheres on the, on the tangent space, and this, this manifold of conjugate vectors, right? So those two things uh, can sometimes be tangent, sometimes be transversal. And sort of depending on the order of contact, you could get any of these formulas and, and there might be others. So when I was working on this, I was trying to find some sort of classification and, um, and I couldn't do it even, I mean, even in finite dimensions, right? So all of this is also true if you just like say, let's just take some finite dimensional Riemannian manifold, forget fluids, um, this is still true. Um, but still like um, not aware of any uh, classification. Uh, so, so, so there's still potentially other types of singularities, maybe many others, I don't know. Um, so the meaning of this connecting back with fluids is if you, so you take an initial configuration, let's say it develops a conjugate point, you know it's gonna develop a conjugate point later at time, uh, at, at some time uh, of multiplicity, let's say two, right? So what that means is that there's a kind of family of other initial conditions nearby that will all collapse to the same point, like actually collapse to the same point uh, through that formula, right? So, so you can actually sort of, well, uh, this is like very non-constructive, but, but you know that there exists some, some kind of family of, um, yeah, of, of initial conditions parametrized somehow um, that will that will exponentiate to the same Lagrangian map at time one, right? Um, okay. So one corollary of that is that the exponential map is never injective near a conjugate vector. Um, in sort of finite dimensional Riemannian geometry, that's known as the Morse Tau theorem, and so you can get an L two version of that, right? Um, just just by sort of when you look at this list of formulas. Um, so they're, they're, they're all like clearly non-injective, right? And so these things are generic. So you kind of have like losses of injectivity everywhere. And, um, and that's, that's very vaguely how, how you prove this. Um, so a, a couple of remarks about this work. So there was an earlier proof of um, just this corollary, the, the, the L2 Morsley Tower theorem uh, by Michalik in 2015 using kind of different techniques. So his proof is just directly um, um, an argument for, for the L2 Morsley Tower. And uh, another important remark is this work, if you, if you go to finite dimensional uh, Riemannian manifolds, this was actually studied by Warner way back in 65. Um, he studied singularities of finite dimensional exponential maps and obtained uh, most, but not quite all of the normal forms that I mentioned earlier. And um, and I think that was his thesis, if I remember correctly. Um, and although the proofs are different, the, the notion of regular conjugate vector is, is actually due to him. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, my own work is heavily inspired by, by his. Um, okay, so, so, so this is sort of the picture in uh, 2D. And then in 3D, uh, the situation is very different. So 
Um, in that same paper in 2006, Evan, Michel, and Preston also show that Fred Holmness fails. Um, and conjugate points can actually accumulate along finite geodesic segments. So the singularities of the exp exponential map actually do form some pretty complicated sets. Um, they look uh, sort of very different from 2D. And in particular, they show this in that um, for, for flows on that flat cylinder that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Um, we were able to find a kind of middle ground that's sort of like 2.5D. So if you look at axisymmetric flows, um, then the failure of red homeness can kind of be connected with the swirl. So um, this appeared in 2020, and we started working on it a little, little earlier. Um, so, so we showed uh, together with Michelle and Preston that along axisymmetric flows, if you have sufficiently small swirl, then X actually remains a nonlinear fried home map of index zero. Um, so it kind of behaves like it wants to be 2D, but um, as soon as the swirl grows, then, then you know, we don't necessarily know anymore. And uh, in this work um, in 2020, we also use sort of, sort of this notion of uh, killing field to produce more examples of this. So, um, if you have a killing field on your manifold M, so in this case, any, any killing field, then we say that an initial condition is axisymmetric. Um, if it commutes with uh, uh, the, the Lie bracket is zero um, with K, with the killing field, and uh, swirl free. So we define swirl in this kind of generalized sense. If um, the inner product with uh, the killing field is, we define swirl by the inner product with the killing field, and uh, we say that it's swirl free if that quantity is, is zero. And so in that paper, we looked at um, sort of all these Thurston geometries. They're, they're sort of standard examples of 3D manifolds. Uh, we looked at things like the three sphere, three dimensional hyperbolic space, and you can write um, sort of axisymmetric in this sense, versions of the Euler equations for those. And, uh, and they look a little different and sort of interesting. And um, yeah, and, and so that, that, that was uh, the work in that paper. And um, we also show that kind of ties up with, with the, the whole picture here that th there is a corresponding actually subgroup of axisymmetric diffeomorphisms. So this subgroup A is just like you take um, volume preserving diffeomorphisms on your manifold M and you look at the ones that commute with the flow of K. And that's a kind of, uh, sort of the integral of that condition of the Lie bracket uh, commuting. And uh, we prove in that paper that this is a smooth submanifold of the volume preserving ones. And so you have this sort of chain of um, inclusions here with a, a, a stricter kind of axisymmetric um, subgroup. And, uh, it's sort of missing in this picture um, a swirl-free group, right? So, so if you look at this, you're like, wow, there's axisymmetric and a swirl-free is sort of even more special. Um, but th th there's some weird non-integrability uh, conditions that, that, that appear here. And um, I believe the only case of all the examples we looked at, the only case in which you could talk about an actual group of swirl-free diffeomorphisms was in R3, like the standard axisymmetric flows. Um, and so it just feels like there's something missing in this picture. Um, but in any case, um, for the swirl-free flows, if in, even if you don't have a group, um, those norm normal forms that I mentioned earlier and uh, the theorems that were true in 2D, they sort of can be carried over. Um, all you need is essentially Fred Holmes. That's kind of what, um, what, what drives the uh, those those results about kind of local forms and local behavior of the exponential map. Um, okay, and so I think that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much. Um, questions from the local audience? I think I'll carry that. Uh, I wants to ask myself. 
Yeah, I have two unrelated questions. The first one is in that uh, theorem that uh, remains a Fred Holm uh, map if it's a uh, small swirl. Uh, are there examples of flows that we know that if we start with a small swirl, it remains small? Because typically this thing can grow, but I don't know if there are examples where this uh, remains small. Okay, so it's okay. Okay. Um, and, and my second question is like in your last theorem, uh, this submanifold A. So uh, I'm just wondering so, so is it proved by some inverse uh, function theorem type of argument? Do you have to find some regular points or something like that? Yeah. So, so can, can you can make some comments on the proof? That's my. Right, right. So, so you, yeah, you have to exponentiate, exponentiate those um, sort of locally. It, it is a sort of inverse function theorem again. Um, and just make sure they don't land outside the, so yeah, the, the exponential of uh, the axisymmetric ones land on what we call axisymmetric dimorphisms. Um, it is all done in sort of Sobolev category, so uh, very similar to uh, uh, sort of having Mars inside. Yeah. Very nice talk. So, so um, your result on the, uh, conjugate vectors, the set of conjugate vectors being co dimension one smooth manifold. Does it imply that you have sort of infinite dimensional family, of, like give non explicitly, but an infinite dimensional family of conjugate points? I mean, just along those different. Um, yes, I think if I understand. So, so infinite dimensional family, I mean, if you vary the initial condition, right? Yeah, so you fix an initial condition, you know that if you go off in that direction, for infinite dimensional set of initial conditions, you've had, is it, I mean, like these other things are just examples, but this right. says there are really lots of them. Right, right, yeah. So, and so the way you do that is there's this index form in the paper of which I'll be pressing, the index one as well, that sort of controls um, how many conjugate points you, you, you have on the segment. And so you kind of fix the segments a little bit later, a little bit before, and, and vary the initial condition. And you know that they can't disappear locally. And so that, that's how the co dimension one comes up. It's like you have this radial direction where it stays fixed. But um, yeah, it's sort of all, all the other directions you, you have a little, little patch at least. So, so this is dimension two, this result, or? Uh, M is two dimension. That's right. And then Schnellman has a result that says sort of along any, any flow, if you wait long enough, you get a conjugate point. Is that right? Like the, in three dimensions. Cut okay, okay. So his version. Okay, but this is kind of that result for a co-dimension one set of vector fields, right? Right. Okay. Any other questions here? Uh, I have one. Um, so you had mentioned the uh, in two D the exponential map cannot be one to one. Mm -hmm. um near this do you get anything like a local surge activity result uh in based on your normal forms that's a good question it's actually also not low i'm sure i'll speak into this it, i don't i think it's okay like just somewhat near it okay um i think it's also those normal forms are not locally surjective also like that that you can just check with the formulas right and so in fact uh one of them the the it's called the fold one, uh, like the middle one for multiplicity one. That looks like you're sort of hitting a barrier and coming back. Um, and so it, it it sort of misses a lot, but of course it's just a local picture. And so, but it looks like they're trying to, in some sense, prevent you from going forward, but it doesn't, you know, I wish I could say something about surge activity, but of course it can be a far away geodesic that goes around that and, and so i don't know yeah. Yeah, so you're anywhere piecing them together to try and get some local surgery i would love to do that but uh, i don't know how yeah <laughs>